OK, so let's, um, let's think back to life in R3. This was like the simple times when we just lived in Euclidean space, places like R3. And I want to think about some vector in R3. Let's think about the vector, oh, let's call it the vector, um, I don't know, maybe 2, minus 3, and 4. And it's like, what is that thing, right? And it's like, well, one way to see this thing is we can draw it. And when we draw it, we go 2 in the x direction down three in the z direction, and over, oh, down three in the y direction, whoa. Yeah, got that one backwards, down three in the y direction, y, and up four in the z direction, one, two, three, four. So I want to end up going to like this point, and here I have this vector. But this notation and way of drawing immediately suggests something. It immediately suggests the way to think about this is a linear combination. This is just a linear combination of the vectors, one in the x direction, one in the y direction, one in the z direction. That is, this is just two copies of the guy that goes one in the x direction, plus negative three copies of the guy that goes one in the y direction, plus four copies of this guy that goes one in the z direction. Yeah? Okay, so, so this is nothing, this is nothing, um, you know, uh, particularly profound. It's just reminding you that any vector in R3, doesn't have to be this one, any vector, any vector x, y, z, can be expressed as a linear combination of these three vectors, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So what do we call these three vectors? What's the name we had? Great. So these three vectors form a basis. So um, if we give them some, some names, I think typically you call them something like maybe E1, E2, and E3. But these form a basis. You have a basis for R3, which is E1, E2, and E3. And in some sense, this is like the natural basis, the God-given basis, right? So, so we, I might refer to this as like a standard basis. It's, it's the kind of basis that, that you know, just makes sense. But you can pick some other basis if you wanted to. What are three other elements, uh, three other vectors that could give you a basis? What? I. Well, I want to stay in R3, so just give me three other vectors. Three other vectors I can build a basis out of. Two, zero, 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 two. Okay, so instead of ones, use one twos. You're just going to scale this all by two, is that the idea? So two, zero, 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 two, zero, 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 two. Yeah, that's sure, that's fine, because then you're just going to scale these coefficients by a factor of a half. That's not very interesting. Let's come up with some more interesting, I don't know. How about, how about I do something like, how about I do this? Does that give me a basis? Well, like, let's try it. Let's try it with our example of two, negative three, four. Can we achieve two, negative three, four as some linear combination of these guys? Well, now this is kind of like a puzzle, right? Well, we could make a cool app that does something like this. Okay, maybe that's not the most exciting app idea. But, but here we go. What, what should our coefficients be? Anyone see it?
Is it not immediately jumping out? Trying different possibilities. Maybe we don't know. Maybe we should just say, I don't know what this is. Let me call it A. Let me call it B. Let me call it C. Now I'm going to get a system of equations. I want my two to be equal to zero copies of A, one copy of B, and one copy of C. So two is just B plus C. Negative three should be one copy of A. So A, no copies of B, a copy of C. So A plus C. And I want my four to be a copy of A plus a copy of B. Yeah, so here's a system of equations. Three unknowns, three equations. Let's see if we can find a solution to it. Um, well, let's just get rid of the variable C. So I'm gonna subtract the second equation from the first equation. So subtracting the second from the first, I get two minus negative three, which gives me five. And then I get B minus A. Those C's canceled. So I now have a B minus A and an A plus B. Let me add those together. These two equations I'm gonna add. So now my minus A and A will cancel, giving me two B on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, I'll have five and four, which is nine. Hence, B will be four and a half, nine halves. And now that we know what B is, we can go back and recover what A is. A must be what? Yeah, I think it's negative a half. Comes over as A, you subtract five. Four and a half minus five is negative one half. And now that we know A, we could plug in somewhere here to figure out C is. C must be something like, I think negative two and a half or negative five halves. So now we have our solutions for A, B, and C. Those are the coefficients. That is, here we would just have the coefficients, negative one half, nine halves, and negative five halves. And that'll do the trick. We get two because nine halves minus five halves is four halves, which is two. We built it that way. So yeah, we're able to get two, negative three, four. Are we able to get any value? If I picked some other vector, would I be able to form it from these three vectors? Well, we can just say instead of this one, let's just pick some arbitrary vector, x, y, z, and then you would just solve a new set of equations where you have x, y, and z, and you would see you can always get a unique solution for a, b, and c in terms of whatever your x, y, and z are, right? So we won't do it, you, you can do this, but you can verify that for any x, y, and z, there's a unique set of solutions here for a, b, and c, which will be defined in terms of your x, your y, and your z. So sure enough, here is another basis. Well, we haven't really shown this is a basis. I guess all we've shown at this point is that from these three vectors, you can get anything in R3. That is, the span of these three vectors gives you everything in R3. What else do we want to be a basis? One more condition. What was that? Linearly independent, yeah. It's like, you know, we want to say these three are a basis, and, and if you add some other vector, like if you also threw in at the end like one, 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 well, you could do that, but this is redundant. You don't need this extra vector, right? So, so and, and if you add that vector, no longer will the collection be linearly independent. And so we don't need this vector. So, so here's our definition. If B is a subset of your vector space, um, so this B is called a basis if two things hold. The span of B recovers all of V, which is just saying 
any vector in your vector space can be built up as a linear combination of your vectors in B. But also, B is linearly independent. There are no redundant vectors in there. Okay? So, so perhaps you're familiar with this for, for places like R3. But we've been talking about in this course other vector spaces. So let's, let's consider one of our other vector spaces. What's one of the ones we've been talking about? Polynomials. So, so here's P, which is my collection of polynomials, right? And, and when I don't include a number up here, it means polynomials of all powers, up to any power, right? Quadratics, quintics, whatever. Is there a basis for this guy? What would my basis be? Yeah, powers of x, beginning at x to the zero, one, x, x squared, x cubed, and so forth. Again, I'll remind you, we're thinking of these polynomials as being over the real numbers. So my scalars are gonna come from reals, these are real valued polynomials. We could do the same thing with complex numbers. Let's just limit our attention to reals, but let's check. Is it true that the span of this is all of your collection of polynomials? Yeah, any polynomial is just a linear combination of some powers of x. Right, like by definition, right? Any, any polynomial. So any p of x inside this collection can be written as some, you know, coefficient um, C0 plus C1x plus C2x squared up to some power of x, Ck, x to the k, what, whatever that power is. Might be a very big power, seven, five trillion, whatever. But to be a polynomial means you can be written like this. And then, sure enough, this spans your entire vector space P. Is it also the truth that these are linearly independent? Well, that was the last lecture, right? We had an argument that showed this was linearly independent. So sure enough, this is a basis for P. Yep. And, and, and this is kind of like a standard basis, right? This is, this is the most natural basis you can come up with. But can you think of another basis for P? Something a little more interesting? A little less natural? Yeah. Um, so start with one, then have x plus one, then have x squared plus x plus one, x cubed plus x. Oh, so the proposal here is we're going to have one, <coughs> x, oh, you said x plus one, yeah? X plus one, x squared plus x plus one x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one, so forth. So here's a proposal. Is this a basis? Well, let me give this some name. So, so um, I don't know if this is like a standard basis, I should call this set something. Uh, I don't wanna call it B because it's kind of assuming it is a basis, so. Okay, we'll call it capital X, great. <laughs> is, this, is this a basis? for P. Well, two things we want to check. First, we want to ask, what is the span of this collection? Do we recover all of P? Okay, if so, why? He can, he can recover the original natural basis by subtracting the previous one from the... Oh, 
so you're doing a very clever argument. The most straightforward way, the way you would think, just going by definition, is you would want to say, well, let some thing be an element of P, then you can write your P of X as some, um, just as we did before, as some um, C0 plus C1X plus all the way up to CKX to the K. And then we want to show that there exists a solution. We want to show that there exists a solution to this is equal to some multiple, so I need a new, a new uh, coefficient name, so maybe some multiple a0 times 1 plus some multiple a1 times x plus 1 plus some multiple a2 times x squared plus x plus 1 plus up to some power. Remember, in this, we can't do an infinite linear combination. We only allow ourselves finite linear combinations. This is our, our definition of, of span, right? Span is all possible finite linear combinations with the vectors in B. So up to some, I don't know, AM of x to the m plus all the way down to x plus 1. And you would want to argue there's some solution to this, right? So, so how do you know there's some solution to this? Okay, I think you're doing a separate argument right now. And we'll, we'll do that argument in a second. But first, like, how do I just know that I can like, find some coefficient for my AM and for each of these guys? Great, so you would want to group these things by um, the associated like, powers of x, right? And so, so we already know what's gonna happen. Our m is gonna come out to equal our k because you don't want this to be a higher power of x than you have here, right? And it can't be a lower one either. And then you say, well, so, so we wanna show, you know, is there a solution to this? And we're like, well, this thing is the same as just group your coefficients in front of xk. The only coefficient of x to the k is ak. So it's just ak x to the k plus, and then like what is your coefficient of x to the k minus one? And you're like, well, the coefficient of x to the k minus one is there'll be an ak and there'll be an ak minus one. And, and so on this way, like the coefficients of x to the k minus two will be, I guess we can write it, the coefficient of, of x to the k minus two will be your ak plus ak minus one plus ak minus two, all the way down to like, what is your constant coefficient? Well, it's an a zero, but also an a one and an a two all the way through ak. So your constant coefficient is ak plus all the way down to a zero. And now he's really trying to show that there's some solution here. It's like, well, what is the solution? He's like, well, we see what the solution is. Just let my ak be ck. So, so my, my solution here, I don't know, I'm kind of out of space, but there is a solution. Just let your, your AK be CK, and then you're like, okay, and then you also have to have AK plus AK minus one needs to be the same as your coefficient of X to the K minus one needs to be CK minus one. But now that we know what AK is, we can figure out that it's actually CK plus AK minus one, and therefore we get that AK minus one is just Subtract that CK from the other side, CK minus one minus CK, so on and so on. You just keep going this way. Point is, this AK has to agree with that CK. Once you know what AK is, you can then figure out what AK minus one is, then you can figure out what AK minus two is, all the way down to where you figure out what A zero is. Okay? So this clearly has a solution. Great. That has a solution. That's one way to argue. The span is, uh, the span of x is the whole 
vector space. But you are offering a different argument, which I think is actually a bit nicer. Alternatively, you are pointing out if you look at span of x, you already have a 1 inside of there. Yeah? You also have an x inside the span of x. Why is there an x inside of here? Because x is just your x plus 1 minus 1. So x is also inside the span of x. And x squared is inside the span of x. How do we get x squared? Well, x squared is just x squared plus x plus 1 minus x plus 1. And in general, we actually get x to the k is inside the span of x, because x to the k for any power is just x to the k plus x to the k minus 1 plus all the way down minus the one that's one less than it x to the k minus 1 all the way down. Hence, all the powers of x are inside of here. But we also know that span of x is a vector space. Yeah, we proved this, that the span of a set of vectors is itself a vector space. Hence, not only do you have all the powers of x in there, you'll have all linear combinations of them in there as well. Because it's a vector space. So since these elements are in there, um, you can scale them, you can add them, you can get any linear combination of them, and it's still inside of there. Hence, the span of the set containing 1, x, x squared, x cubed, and so forth, all linear combinations of them, is a subspace of the span of x. x is a subset of your vector space. Hence, it must live inside of your vector space. But this span is just the span of our standard basis, which we know is the entire vector space. The span of x must also be the entire vector space. The point here is just, if you can recover the vectors in your standard basis in some other span, then you know that span must give you the entire vector space, right? Because you get all of your standard basis elements in there, all your standard basis vectors. Okay, are we happy? I guess there's one more thing we need to do before we can be convinced that this x really is a basis for p. And what is that? Linear independence. So how can we argue this is linear independent? Yeah. I mean, the, the typical way we argue linear independence is we're saying that there's nothing redundant, nothing in there is a linear combination of other things in there, which is the same as saying the only solution to C0 times 1 plus C1 times X plus 1 plus up through whatever ck times x to the k plus all the way down to x plus 1, 
the only solution to this being zero is the trivial solution, right? So we want to show there are no non-trivial solutions to this. Nothing other than all these coefficients being zero. OK. So how can we do that? Ah, same, same argument as before. The only coefficient of x to the k is ck. And then the coefficient of x to the k minus 1, we've already done this, is just ck plus ck minus 1, x to the k minus 1. All the way down to, you know, like your constant coefficients are going to be your ck, you get a constant one there, and each of them, each, each of these c's gives you a constant, all the way down to c1 plus c0. We're saying this is 0, but that's saying that this polynomial is equal to this polynomial, this being the trivial polynomial, which means all of the coefficients here must be 0. So we're saying that this must be 0, and this must be 0, all the way down to this last one is 0. But the first one being 0 is just saying ck is 0. Once you know ck is 0, the second one is just saying ck minus 1 is 0. All the way down to once you know all the previous ones are 0, you can then finally conclude c0 is also 0. Hence, the only solution to this is the trivial solution. Sure enough, linearly independent. OK, similar trick that we played before. We happy with this? Let's, let's look at one more. So we were looking at polynomials just now. What if I want to restrict my attention to a subset of the vector space of polynomials. So instead of looking at all polynomials, I'm only going to look at PE, which I define to be the even polynomials. This is going to be the even polynomials. Do you remember what I mean by calling a function even? So, so a function is called even if it satisfies, do you remember this? f of x is the same as f of minus x. That's what I mean by the word even. So for example, if you think about the uh, cosine function, cosine of something a little bit negative or cosine of something a little bit positive are both, are both going to give you the same thing. Is that true, cosine? Cosine, that's okay, yeah. Not sine, but cosine, yeah. Cosine's odd, uh, sine's odd, cosine's even. Or, like the prototypical example would be something like x squared, right? You plug in x or negative x in, you get x squared, which is kind of the basis of this name. Well, I guess, you know, I should convince you that this is really a vector space. So let's convince ourselves of this really fast. Why is this a vector space? Well, it, it's a subset of something that we know is a vector space. So we need to check two things. What do we need to check? Great. So, so first, let's just verify that this is a vector space, and then we'll look for a basis of it. Um, let's say I take some, some two elements, f and g, that are both inside of here. What, what can you tell me about f plus g? Is that also going to belong to the set of even functions? Yeah. Why? Yeah, f plus g of some value x is just defined to be f of x plus g of x, which since f and g are even, that's just f of minus x plus g of minus x, which is just f plus g of minus x. Hence, f plus g is even, right? And then, so it's closed under addition, and then we also want to show, show it's closed in a scaling. Here, I'm going to keep in the reals. We're working over R for this lecture. So 
Um, f is inside of there, and let c be some real number. Well, since f is inside of here, you already know f of x equals f of minus x. But then it's like, what can you say about c times f? Well, c times f is just defined to be that number times f of x, which is the same as c times f of minus x, which is cf of minus x. So if two things are equal, they're still equal after multiplying both sides by a real number, right? So this is a vector space. What's a basis for it? What's a possible basis? So let's, let's throw a candidate out. Who do you think is a good candidate to be our basis? I'm hearing even numbers like x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth. Like the name here is a little bit suggestive, even, right? Oh, don't forget though, the favorite even number, zero. x to the zero should maybe also be in here, which is one. So how can we show this is in fact the basis? How can we show that the even polynomials are exactly the polynomials that are built up of things of even powers of x? Well, there are two things to show. One is span, one is linear independence. So let's do the first one. Um, let's give this collection some name. Uh, I guess I'll call it big Y. How do we know that the span of Y recovers the entire collection? We just have to use the definition. Let f be some function inside of p of e. Well, if it's inside of p of e, it's still a polynomial. Thus, we can write f as just some polynomial, some c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared up to some power, ck x to the k. Now, what we're going to want to show in a second is that all of these odd powers, all those coefficients vanish. So we want to argue c1 is 0 and c3 is 0 and all of those are 0. But we can at least say f of x is some polynomial. What do we do next? Well, like the only data we have, if f is inside of p of e, we should use the fact that f satisfies this relationship. Hence, f of x is equal to f of negative x. But what is f of negative x? You plug in negative x to this guy, you get c0, plug in negative x minus c1x, plug in negative x for the even powers, it stays plus, plus c2x squared. I mean, maybe I should do a few more here so you can really see this pattern, you know, it's just c3x cubed. So, so now the, the x cubed, when you plug in the negative x, a negative cubed is negative, so it's minus c3 x cubed, all the way to plus or minus, I guess it depends on this power. I guess we could say it's plus negative one to the k. It's, it's gonna depend on if this power is even or odd. Ck x to the k, right? Okay, so I have these two things are equal to each other. I guess these are equal. So like, what, what can we do with them? I guess there are two moves you can make. 
Yeah, you can add or subtract. I mean, either way is going to get us the same result. I I'm just going to say, since these equal, let me subtract one side from the other. So I'm going to subtract this guy from the guy above it. C0 minus C0, he's gone. C1 from C1, I now have two copies of C1, x to the first power, plus these will cancel when I subtract. The minus becomes plus, plus two copies of C3, x cubed, plus uh, the, the x to the fourth will cancel. I'll, I'll just have my x to the fifth. That gets doubled all the way up until, well, I guess it depends if x to the k is even or odd, if we stop there or if we stop at k minus 1. Um, let's just imagine that k here is odd, but it would be very similar if k was even. 2ck x to the k. I mean, maybe I'll just leave it ambiguous and write 2j plus 1, 2j plus 1, where well, that's your largest odd power, whatever that is. But we subtracted something from itself. So what is this equal to? Zero. Zero. And like, here's the thing not to miss. You know that x, x cubed, x to the fifth, x to the whatever that odd power is, that those are linearly independent. Because since they're linearly independent, they're linearly independent p. That's a basis for p. So they have to be linearly independent. So the only solution to this is when all the coefficients are zero. So that means all my odd coefficients, c1, c3, c5, up to whatever that last odd coefficient is, all zero, which is exactly what we wanted to show. That you can write any function f with just even coefficients as long as f is inside of p of e. I've pretty much already said it, but, but let's just you know, write it down. I mean, the second thing we want to show is we want to show that these are linearly independent. But why are these linearly independent? Yeah, this is a subset of your basis 1x, x squared, so forth, which is linearly independent in P. And so if you're just taking a subset of them, they're still going to be linearly independent. So that one comes for free. OK. Questions, concerns up to this point? Then I want to prove one little theorem. We've been saying that once you have a basis, you can write any element of your vector space as a linear combination of that basis. What I want to argue is that there's only one way to do that. Just like when we were back here, in this case of R3, and we said there's only one way to write, you know, there's only one way to write something like 4. I forgot what it was. I think it was like 3, minus 2, 4. There's only one way to write that as a linear combination of 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. It's like only one way to do that. It's 3 plus negative 2 copies of this plus 4 copies of the last one. It's only one solution. You, you, won't, you won't find another one. And I want to say that holds in general. So if B is a basis for some vector space, then uh, every vector in that vector space can be uniquely written 
as a linear combination of vectors in your basis B. Well, I'm honing in on the word uniquely. We already know every vector can be written as a linear combination of vectors in B because B spans your vector space. So you already have that. The new content here is we're saying that, that representation is unique. Okay, so we've all done some kind of intro to proof course. So how do we prove something like this? Suppose not. When you want to show that there's a unique representation, you imagine two different representations, and, and then you really show how uh, secretly those two are the same, right? So, suppose we can write some vector in your vector space as, oh, I don't know, let's try two different things. Um, let's say it's um, coefficient C, uh, C1, V1 plus C2, V2 all the way up to CK, VK, where these are elements where my V1 through my VK are all elements of B. Vectors in my basis. And suppose you can also write V as, well, now we can be a little bit careful. Remember, B might be infinite, like in the case of polynomials. And, and so it may be the case that there are other vectors in v, B that we didn't use here. There may be extra vectors that went unused in this linear representation. Here we only use finitely many vectors from B, but maybe there are infinitely many vectors to choose from. Which is just to say there might be some extra vectors we used in the second representation that we didn't use in the first one. Now, now we can include all the ones from the first one, because if we don't need it, we'll just make the coefficient zero. So we'll include all these vectors from the, from the first representation, but, but there could be some extra ones, some vk plus one up through, you know, whatever, some, some vm, let's say. So there could be some extra vectors. So let me include that all the way up through vm, all vectors from my basis. And they're gonna have some coefficients. And they might be different from above, so let me give them a different name. Let me call it d1, d2, dk, dk plus one, all the way through dm. Okay, now what can we say? I have two different representations. I want to argue they're equally the same. How do we do that? Great. I'm going to subtract one from the other. I'm going to do v minus itself, which we know is just the zero vector, yeah? Okay, let's say we're doing the bottom one minus the top one. What do we get? My first coefficient becomes d1 minus c1. That's the coefficient of my v1. All the way through for the last one, it becomes dk minus ck for that vk. And then for, for the vk plus one onward, there's nothing to subtract from it. So I still have dk plus one, vk plus one through dm vm. How does that help me at all? Mm -hmm. Good. Since this V1 through Vm belong to B, they're linearly independent. And so the only time you can have a linear combination that comes out to be zero is when your coefficients are all zero. But what does it mean for all these coefficients to be zero? What does it mean for all these coefficients to be zero? Yeah, it means all of those extra ones at the end are just zero. So those all vanish. And each of these d1 through dk's are actually the same as your c1 through ck's. 
Hence, the two representations are actually the same representation. There's only one way to write V as a linear combination of elements in B. Okay, in the last minute, I want to raise a question. Here we've been working with polynomials, and, or even polynomials, and this is really good. You've been doing a great job of finding bases for them. But what if I had selected a different, a different vector space? What if I had asked us to consider the vector space f? Do you remember what I mean by f? All real valued functions. What's the basis for that? You're like, that's too messy. Okay, I'll, I'll do it a little bit kinder. What if I just said C, all continuous functions? And you're like, well, I know a whole lot of continuous functions, like all my polynomials, throw that all in, x, x squared, all that. But then there's like sine and cosine, all of that's in there. So maybe, maybe you just build a basis by listing all of the, the, val the functions you're familiar with. It's like, did you get them all? It's like, did you include the Weierstrass function? That weird function that's continuous everywhere but differentiable nowhere? Right, like, like can, can we find bases for these things? Well, it turns out you can. You can always find a basis for a vector space, but only by appealing to Zorn's lemma which is the statement that's equivalent to the axiom of choice. Which is to say, in practice, it's not very feasible to actually list one, right? There's, there's gonna be some vector spaces where it's quite puzzling, like how am I actually gonna list out what my basis is? If you accept the axiom of choice, then you can say a basis exists, right? Some infinite bases exist. But for a number of vector spaces, they're quite hard to describe. We'll continue our discussion of bases, particularly bases of infinite dimensional vector spaces next week.